Next, we're going to have a conversation with Randy Weingarten. Randy, please, Randy, please come out and join me. She, as you know, is the president of the American Federation of Teachers. We have been communicating with each other around education issues for many years, going back to New York when I was covering education a long, long, long time ago. Um, just curious. Not so long ago. Oh, not just okay. Not not so far in the in the rearview mirror in the not too distant past. Um, as you listened as the the head of the teachers union um, to this conversation around charter schools, I'm just wondering about. Um, what was going through your your mind with this conversation? Because I remember early on, uh, the teachers union was very wary of charter schools, and the the the, the fist has opened up now. So um, let me just say this: first off, happy holiday, everyone. Yeah. And do you? And I hope everyone does something nice for themselves and their families over the next few days. That's number one. Um, the school teacher in me. <laughs> number two. The you know as I was listening, I um, and I don't mean it I don't mean it sarcastically. I just was going like oh god, as I was listening to the conversation because first off, number one, Al Shanker, one of my predecessors, was one of the first people who talked about charters and actually created charters. I run a charter in New York City that has a 100% graduation rate for our kids in the South Bronx. We organize charters. Um, the charter school industry does not want to be organized. Um, they did a huge anti-union push against Paul, um, scaring in, in D.C. just in the last few days, scaring the um, teachers, threatening them with firing and things like that. They don't want people to have voice. But more important than this, we've had an experiment for charters for about 25 years. We've had an experiment with um, the federal intervention in um, education for about 50 years. So why did the federal intervention in education, and I heard the point about integration does not equal equality, equality does not equal integration, although I would actually argue that integration is very, very important for lots of societal reasons. Having said that, in the first 25 years of the Johnson War on Poverty, we actually reduced the achievement gap more than we have in the last 25 years. The last 25 years, we have been very focused on a sanction and penalty process. Doesn't mean that some schools are not going to do well, but why is it that we reduced inequity more in the first 25 than the last 25? And there is a, there's a, there's, there's, there's some data from the international PISA results that actually tell us why, which is that the countries that do better than we do internationally out-prepare and out-invest. Even though I still think that U US, we actually believe in access and attainment far more than almost all the countries that out-compete us, including China, including others. The countries that actually took on full on the strategies that were being talked about on stage, Chile and Sweden, have done terribly and are actually moving away from that kind of full choice privatization process. So the reason I say, oh God, and, 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 sh and shrug is because we do have a lot of data in charters and in public schools about what works. And rather than actually really using our muscle about what works, we're still having the same argument that I've actually been part of for the last 10 or 20 years. And, and I wonder, how do we break out of that argument and really kind of sort of focus on what works and create the muscle of what works? So you just mentioned the other countries that outperform us um, make a larger investment in some cases. How does that happen? Is that Are you talking about investment by the government? Are you talking about involvement in the business community? Are, or are you talking about the kind of psychic investment that people are just more engaged of, and invested in schools, even if their children do not attend them? All of the above. Meaning, um, and, 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 but it does start with, it, it, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go into American exceptionalism or not American exceptionalism right now. But what ends up happening is, and there is, they actually look and feel more like rural and suburban communities than cities. 
in that there is a comp that the schools become the center of communities, even though they're federal systems. So you know the the in many of the countries that outcompete us, they have federalized systems where they have one set of standards that didn't really work so well with Common Core, which became Common Testing. But they have so so let's put that aside for a second. But what they do do is they like you take Finland. You take um, uh, Singapore, um, take Poland even. Mm -hmm. There's a real focus on meeting the child where the child is and on children's well-being. Instead of basically when somebody shows up to school and say, okay, you're going to pass this test, and if you don't, you and your teacher and your school are going to be in trouble. Because and they don't do that. They, they really kind of focus on children's well-being. And then the second thing they do is testing, even in China. I mean, Korea, let's put Korea aside for a second. But even in China, testing is about um, an, a point in time. It's not about assessing the teacher. It is about trying to figure out where the kid is and what you need so it's to truly do. more diagnostic. It's much more diagnostic. And, and yet, because there's a different culture, you know, lots of kids in China want to do well on tests. But what I hear from kids a lot, and I talk to kids a lot, is that schools have become joyless. It's all, and, and, and if we don't create joy somewhere in kids' lives, life is tough. Half the kids in America who go to public schools are poor. By the way, even after 25 years of vouchers and charters, 86% of kids still go to traditional public schools. And many of those children bring with them more than just educational needs. I mean, the school exactly. is the bedrock in the community. The teacher is the person who keeps an eye on them. The school is where they are, they are fed emotionally as, as well as nutritionally. Exactly right. And, um, Which is why I know... I know I'm trying not to be partisan right now, but we do actually have to fight. You're, you're not trying all that the hard. The budget cuts. <laughs> but I called myself out, so you all knew where, what was coming. But look, the budget cuts to say every nutritional program goes bye-bye in the next budget. It's a little crazy. Uh, well, since you took us to politics, let's just stay there for it. Let's, let's dwell in that garden for just a minute. Um, most of us have seen the electoral maps, and you understand how the public as a whole voted, but it's really interesting when you look at how teachers voted. And a majority of, um, not, excuse me, not a majority, but a good number, let me take that back, it's not a majority, but it's a sizable number of AFT members voted for Donald Trump. Actually, we did, a, we did some surveying. 80% of our members voted for Hillary. 60% um, of NEA members voted for Hillary. Uh, but a number of them voted for Donald Trump, a good Absolutely. number. And if you look in some areas, there are core concentrations of, of where that actually happened. And so what does that not, say about your ability to... We have a lot of Republicans. To... Pardon? We have a lot of Republican members. Well, that's not surprising. You don't oh, have to whisper it's fantastic. that. fantastic. You don't need to whisper that. I that's, love that's, that. That's not necessary. But <laughs> I want to have more. But I wonder what that says about your ability to engage with the Trump administration, with the Trump administration, um, mm -hmm. do you feel at this point that there is a, a moment uh, within AFT to actually reach out and create coalitions within AFT mm -hmm. to figure out how to better and successfully and productively engage with the new administration? So I think this is a very difficult question because you you've known me for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I know this, for those of you who don't know me, this is going to sound really, really cognitively dissonant. If I can find common ground, I do. I hate to fight. And frankly, I wish, I thought that post-ESSA, the new federal law, we were about to have a renaissance in terms of education because there was at least a sense of what to do in states where you had guardrails for equity um, but yet states, and particularly people at the local level, were going to have a lot more autonomy in terms of what was in the collective interest of school children. So put that aside. We're back into a war. And the war is foundational, which is the problem. Public education is a bedrock of democracy. And there can be lots and lots of different choices, 
but you can't actually devalue, defund, destabilize the public choice um, in order to lift up other choices. And the problem in terms of the current um, Secretary of Education, who, frankly, I invited to come to a school even before she was secretary, the first conversation I had with her, which was 11 minutes long on Valentine's Day, um, I reissued that invitation. And she, very publicly, on Friday, I kind of sort of giggled, because before I even got the voicemail, I saw a press release saying that Betsy DeVos has accepted Randy Weingarten's invitation to go to a school in rural Ohio. So, and, and, and so, look, she's the Secretary of Education. I want, her to, I want her to be held responsible for all the children in our land. And so I thought it was important for her to see schools where people wanted to, to invite her. I don't believe in barring the door to the Secretary of Education. I think that she has a responsibility to go into schools. But the, but the bottom line is, when I say it's foundational, our responsibility is to make sure that there is public school options for children in America that befit what parents want for their kids. That is our first responsibility. And she would say the same thing. She wouldn't agree with you. She, she wouldn't disagree with you on this. She would say that, exactly the same thing. Except that actions speak louder than words. And I've spent a lot of time in Michigan, and she did the complete opposite in Michigan as a chief lobbyist outside. I watched the schools in, in, in Detroit being defunded, destabilized. I was in those Detroit schools where rats were running around, where there was, you know, heat in the summer and, and, and no heat in the winter, and where when there was a tremendous consensus of Republicans and Democrats alike, including Mitt Romney's brother-in-law, about a Detroit rescue plan. She fought that rescue plan. And why? Because it created charter accountability from the mayor just this past June. So that's so not creating a viable choice in public schools for our children. So we have We've known each other, as you said, a long time. I, I covered education for many, 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 many years. Um, and I've seen education wars in the past. But something interesting happens at very pugilistic moments in, in, in politics, in policy, and especially education. There's the war that wages, you know, that, that plays out on this. And it's heat. It's, it's full of heat, and it's intense. But something happens with that excess energy. There is a dividend. There's sort of a collateral dividend that that energy, something happens Yes, beneath the surface. I agree with you. That people are fighting on this level, but suddenly people are brought to the table, and sometimes productive things happen. We saw that in Chicago. We saw that in New York, where things change in a, in a sort of subrosa way. Is that possibly happening now? I have not seen. So I think there is a tremendous energy, but the energy I saw was that people. There is more um, people who are focused. The public education focus is more visible or vocal than I've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. I've never seen 5 million. I haven't seen 100,000 phone calls to the Senate switchboard on an education secretary. There were 5 million phone calls basically saying, don't put this person in. I think the issue is this. I, I agree with you. I love the energy around in terms of having energy for our kids. But the destabilizing of children right now, the not funding public education, I'm not talking about schools that don't work. The schools that don't work should either be fixed or closed. But we've gone through closing hundreds of schools, and that hasn't worked. But we have to actually get back to what does work. And when you see a budget that actually cuts out what does work, you know we're in trouble. We don't have a lot of time. I want to make sure we get questions from the audience. Um, why don't we do the three questions again, because that seemed to be an effective way to hear from the it's room. It's Passover. You and want then... to do four? OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have microphones. I can't see this side of the room. Questions for Randy? Yes. If not, I can ask another question. Um, is there? Right here. I'm sorry, in the front. You have to raise your hand high so we can see. 
Um, I'd like to hear more about, you, you mentioned integration was an effective strategy to improve school for everyone, but you really haven't spoken much about racism, institutional racism and classism, because the schools that tend not to work don't work for people of color and the poor. So charter schools the same, children are suspended, it's not working for them. So there's something about the way we are not handling and resolving the issues of race and class. And maybe you can talk about that. So look, the issues of race and class are a huge blights on our society and have, you know, are the hidden issues that have created, I think, the polarization that we have in our country right now. I worked my whole life only with kids of color. And I am very proud of it. And I, you know, and 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 I used to burn with fury that the school I went to as a youngster had everything. And the schools I taught in, particularly in the 90s, we had to scavenge for chalk. And our kids were reading textbooks that said Kennedy and when the president was Clinton. And yet when I said to Michelle before, Michelle, before that if there, there are four strategies that I think if we really practiced with real muscle, if we focused on children's well-being, really had wraparound services around schools, take the schools in Hempstead, for example, we then focused, we also engaged in powerful learning. Instead of thinking and, and, and really had an engagement strategy on instruction, then we really focused on, 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 teaching kid, on teaching teachers how to teach, including cultural competencies. And it is really important to have teacher diversity in our schools. And it's really important when you see um, statistics like um, that, that black boys are, are suspended five times more than white girls, that we do something about that. And so well-being, powerful learning, teacher capacity, and then cultures of collaboration, including and most particularly ensuring that communities feel that that school is the center of their community. If we practice those four things, I think we'd be having a really different conversation, both with the charters as well as with traditional public schools, because then you'd be asking us, how do we get to those things as opposed to talking about governance models? I wonder if, we also, if it also requires something akin to radical uh, honesty. Yes. That we're often looking, you know, I wonder what role race plays or I wonder what role classism plays, as opposed to turning that around, race is always present yeah. um, to some degree in particularly always. when policy is involved and as is class and once you admit that it's there, then you figure out how to solve it. I mean, I, you know, it's, um, and I know we're well past time, but, you know, in, in after so many kids and, and um, had died at the hands of police, um, our union and others went through the whole very agonizing process of looking at our own privilege. And I often talked about how, as a gay woman, look, I'm a school teacher who was a gay woman. And you can imagine how scared I was about that for years and years and years. But that was hidden. And I could choose to decide when to talk about it and not. And the, and, and, but if you, if, if, if you don't walk in each other's shoes and understand that there is some effect of discrimination based upon race, sex, ethnicity, on and on and on, then we are not being honest with ourselves in terms of the society. And frankly, part of what public education is about is to create an understanding and a tolerance, and frankly, I would argue, a celebration of that diversity. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Randy Thank Weingarten, you. wonderful conversation. Thank you so much.